Welcome to the review. Today we're taking a look at five short-lived TV shows from 1995. Leave us a comment below if you remember watching any of these. Number five, Madman of the People. One of two 90s attempts at building a lasting sitcom around veteran actor Dabney Coleman, the first of which was an 18-episode season of Drexel's Class that would fail to see its way onto the Fall 92 schedule. This installment, Madman of the People, is one of the highest-rated first-year shows to ever get canceled during its initial run. Hitting the 9.30 time slot on Thursday nights in September as part of NBC's Must See TV. Produced by Spelling Television and featuring Coleman as Jack Madman Buckner, an antiquated yet popular columnist at Your Times magazine. The basic premise introduces us to his daughter Meg, played by Cynthia Gibb. You might recognize Gibb from her role as Holly in the 80s TV drama series Fame or as audiences at the time will have been freshly familiar with her recent parts in Short Circuit 2 and the martial arts action flick Death Warrant, alongside Jean-Claude Van Damme. She's brought in by Buckner's boss in the hopes that she can smooth out some of the gruff and outspoken learnings Buckner clings to, ideally bringing her father's column into the 90s with a more modern and approachable mood. Despite the high audience viewing ratings, it took a beating in the critical reception department, cited as one of the fall season's least likable new comedies, and not even deserving of its comedy label. Like Drexel's class, Madman of the People wound up leaving behind a similar 16-episode legacy. Canceled before the 94-95 season had officially come to a close, Madman of the Critics, it was not. But those positive ratings the series got off to are sure to show that Madman of the People, it certainly was. And no doubt an abundance of folks in the comments will remember tuning into this title and enjoying the show at the time for what it was. Number 4 Tattooed Teenage Alien Fighters from Beverly Hills Four high school students are randomly selected by a nondescript alien named Nimbar to save the galaxy, granting them each a special tattoo based on a celestial constellation that would flash when danger was afoot and endowing them with the power to transform into giant superheroes. When utilizing acrobatic martial arts skills wasn't enough, they could join hands in an interlocking square to form the ultimate galactic sentinel called Nitron. This would aid them in their newfound quest to fight off monsters sent by the evil Emperor Gorgetus. Platforms called Transo Discs, which serve as teleportation devices, would transport the teens to their spontaneous battle destinations, all while working in time to overcome typical adolescent problems at home and school. Whether it's a homage to an outright copy of Sabin's Mighty Morphin Power Rangers is up for speculation. Produced by Deke Entertainment, it debuted on USA Cartoon Express in October to a mixed reception. For starters, the series is notorious for striving to cut costs at every turn. One example is the decision to shoot the installments on videotape, as opposed to the industry standard of better quality film stock. While low in quality, the series wasn't stingy on quantity, as they did manage to cram 40 episodes into a single season run. And this, while Deke had a similar 53-episode series running over on ABC, that series titled Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad is a story for another day. Although tattooed teenage alien fighters from Beverly Hills, discussion is often prefaced by pointing out its shortcomings in the visual department. And let's face it, it's not a program geared towards a general audience. It's worth at least revisiting for a laugh or two. An anonymous fan online summed it up from a nostalgic perspective in a much brighter light, expressing that once you look past the production value, you'll see a very well-written series that is much more of a satire 
of the Power Rangers than any of its other imitators. It has such an awareness about it and treats its characters like real people that have real emotions and real motivations. Taking Mr. Ellis. Taking Mr. Ellis. Boy. Can you identify this handsome young bellboy? Stick around, we'll be right back with the answer. Room 72. No, sir, Charles Ellis. Room 607. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Oh. Number three, the Preston episodes. A recently divorced English professor tries to get a job as a serious writer, but ends up with a job at a gossip magazine. Actor and comedian David Allen Greer stars in the Preston episodes. Filmed in Los Angeles, the show would see Preston leaving New Jersey for Manhattan to chase his lifelong dream. Episodes come with a memorable live-action animated intro. And as with any other time you've caught him on screen, Greer gives 110%. Airing Saturday nights at 8.30 on Fox after Martin, which was one of Fox's highest rated sitcoms running at the time. That was going to be a tough act to follow. Unfortunately, the Preston episodes didn't even come close to building that level of fandom. Greer is all Greer all the time, but that shouldn't surprise anyone who's familiar with his work. So for some, this program is going to be a hard no from the get-go. But even for his longtime fans, the shoddy writing and deliveries are likely to take you away from some of the enjoyment. Nothing is established to warm the audience to this character they've never met before. Getting a date seems to be his only problem in life aside from the job hunt, which that premise is quickly undermined by his settling for a copy editor position at Stuff Magazine a weekly publication made up of scandalous photos with brief and shocking captions. Those around at the time will remember these publications as the 90s version of clickbait videos. If Preston is content giving up that easily, then how can the viewers be expected to continue tuning in? We're not even encouraged to feel bad for him over the divorce aspect as it doesn't seem to bother him. Even when his ex, who he caught cheating on him, shows up to beg for him to return to New Jersey, it's all one big lighthearted affair at his expense. It's evident that somewhere along the production line, something went awry on this one. Following the Halloween episode on October 28th, people had seen enough Preston episodes to last a lifetime, and two of the 10 installments produced were left unaired. Number two, Hawkeye. Occasionally referred to as Hawkeye, the first frontier, the series is based upon novels written by literary legend James Fenimore Cooper. Keeping with tradition, the series features frontiersman Natty Bumpo, referred to by many names, but this series sticks with Hawkeye. Together with his Native American companion, he helps an English woman rescue her husband from the French, all taking place in 18th century New England during the war between French and British troops. Released in syndication by Canal Entertainment on September 17th, the show captured the great outdoors of Vancouver, Canada, and brought it to eager viewers in the States. Set in 1755 Hudson Valley, New York, and documenting the comings and goings of the local settlers as they went about their daily routines. Be that running an English trading post, as does newcomer Elizabeth Shields, played by Wonder Woman herself, Linda Carter. Others living in the vicinity of fictional Fort Bennington include a hard-to-miss Lachlan Munro as McKinney, who along with his simple-minded friend Peavy is hired by Elizabeth to work at the trading post. Viewers enjoyed the mixture of history, literature, humor, and memorable characters, so this title comes with no shortage of positive reviews. Still, the public only received a two-part pilot in 20 episodes before its disappearance in March. Indeed, the look of the whole thing is the best reason to watch it. There are obvious parallels between the style of Hawkeye and that of Hercules, The Legendary Journeys, or any number of shows with a noticeably similar visual appeal. Compare the energetic title sequence of Hawkeye with that of the slightly later Xena Warrior Princess. Much of the visual style we associate with a certain type of 90s adventure show can be traced back to this Hawkeye series. Number 1. Platypus Man How would you like to tune in to a highly promoted sitcom premiering on a newly broadcast station 
to find them literally reading off dictionary definitions. Well, viewers of UPN's January 23rd pilot were treated to just that, opening on an explanation of how the eccentric title came about by the show's main star, comedian Richard Jenny. To begin with, if you have to go to such lengths to aid a potential audience in wrapping their heads around the title of the show alone, you're probably in the wrong business. Jenny developed a comedy routine where he watched a National Geographic special on the platypus. In the routine, Jenny went on to describe how he found himself relating to the TV show. So the concept of Platypus Man was expanded to become the theme behind Jenny's 1992 HBO comedy special. Later to be pitched as a half-hour vehicle designed to bring Jenny's humor to the small screen. 30-minute episodes would feature segments of cooking with the platypus man. Another concept taking from his early developed comedy acts, a sort of cooking show for men. Not just men, but inherently inept men of the one-track mind variety. Perhaps for some kitchen-related puns and innuendo were all that was needed to keep them tuning in. But the majority of viewers who gave it a shot that first week found little reason to return for more. The whole thing feels like a lame inside joke crafted by comedians for comedians that ran on and on to the delight of Jenny alone. By the 13th episode in March, Platypus Man found itself on the brink of extinction. In possibly a more realistic comparison, the series does in fact share some significant qualities with its sea mammal counterpart. For instance, they're both seemingly composed by fusing together an awkward spread of spare parts. Additionally, either one may ultimately leave you feeling uneasy, if not queasy, in the event you stare at it for too long. Well, there you go. There's five short-lived TV shows from 1995. Don't forget to leave us a comment below if you remember watching any of these. As always, thanks for watching, and if you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe for more videos just like this.